incorporación de nuevas líneas de investigación. De hecho, este seminario de prehistoria pues, es eh, hijo de eh, la inserción en la, en la escuela de una nueva línea, que es la línea de, de prehistoria que va a llevar Juan Gibaja, que es uno de los coorganizadores de este, de este seminario, y eh, al que quiero eh, saludar y... Eh, Eh, quiero saludar y, y darle las gracias por eh, esta, esta eh, nueva, nueva incorporación. Eh, este seminario abre, eh, como eh, veremos, eh, abre un ciclo de seminario de, de prehistoria que eh, básicamente se relaciona con esa transición entre el Mesolítico y el Neolítico, que es un periodo importantísimo en la prehistoria eh, y que y... Eh, tuvo un papel fundamental en el proceso de, eh, de, en el devenir de la, de la humanidad y eh, sobre todo porque será eh, a partir de ahora un tema eh, fundamental en la investigación de la Escuela Española de Historia y Arqueología porque va vinculado a uno de los proyectos eh, donde la escuela ha apostado muy fuerte, que es el proyecto de la marmota que va a llevar el mismo Juan Gibaja, que ya hemos escuchado en unas conferencias previas y que será objeto de otros seminarios y de otras eh, líneas de difusión y de, y de divulgación científica. Yo no me quiero entretener mucho porque quiero dar ya paso a los colegas que han eh, coorganizado esto, este ciclo y eh, fundamentalmente aprovechar para eh, dar las gracias a, eh, además de Juan Gibaja, que está aquí con, con nosotros, también a Miriam Cubas y a Harry Robson, que eh, desde de la Universidad de Alcalá, respectivamente, y la Universidad eh, de York, que mm, han contribuido a la organización de este seminario que nos acompañará durante eh, todo, todo el año. Unas eh, recomendaciones simplemente a lo que están siguiendo las, eh, estas conferencias, esta, esta conferencia concreta de, de, eh, de hoy, eh, para que eh, o sea, le, os invito a suscribirse al canal nuestro de YouTube, porque a partir de esa suscripción podréis eh, recibir también eh, todas las informaciones relativas a, a nuestros eh, próximos eh, eventos. Y eh, sobre todo lo que quiero eh, recomendar es que para el debate final, que eh, las preguntas que se quieran hacer, eh, de ponerlas directamente en el chat de YouTube y luego eh, nosotros mismos las recogeremos para eh, trasladarlas a los coordinadores que llevarán eh, el debate. Eh, con esto simplemente quiero eh, saludar a todos los que nos estáis siguiendo y eh, dar las gracias eh, fundamentalmente a todo el personal de la Escuela Española de Historia, Arqueología y Roma del CSIC que con su trabajo, Dietro Liguinte, como se dice en italiano, eh, permite eh, y va a permitir que podamos seguir organizando estas actividades de difusión y de divulgación eh, científica paralelamente. Por lo cual, dejo eh, inmediatamente la palabra a Miriam Cubas para eh, la introducción científica sobre este seminario. Muchas gracias. Bueno, buenas tardes. Eh, bienvenidos a todos y a todas. Espero que disfrutéis de las jornadas. Yo solo voy a hacer una pequeña introducción. Antes de hacerlo, me gustaría agradecer a la Escuela Española de Historia y Arqueología en Roma de Tisí por permitirnos organizar o organizar estas jornadas en colaboración con la Universidad de Alcalá y la Universidad de York. Welcome to the first talk of the revised online, online series entitled The Mesolithic Transitional and the Neolithic Period Throughout Europe and Adjoining Regions. It was our hope to focus primarily on the Neolithic transition throughout Europe. However, unfortunately, some colleagues who we approached were unable to present. As a result, the series evolved to incorporate earlier periods and from a broader geographical region. In this series, we hope to encapsulate hunting and gathering as well as farming, which broadly categorize the Mesolithic and Neolithic periods. The process of neolithization, without any doubt, took place not as one homogeneous movement across the globe and was indeed affected by several factors, which will be explored throughout the series. We welcome all the participants and especially Juan Jose Ibáñez. Today, Juan will present on the multi-regional origins of the Neolithic in Southwest Asia. Thank you for your interest in our series. Uh, 
Hola, buenas tardes a todos, como se dice aquí en italiano. Buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Bueno, primero, antes de introducir a Juan Juan Bañez, quiero decir algo something, something thing. Currently, we have programmed a conference every, every month, with uh, except to August, because uh, August in the, la Escuela Española del Cesic in Rome is closed. Uh, but in this moment, we are preparing the program for September and December for, uh, to 2021, and next year, 2022. And we don't know, um, uh, after 2022, uh, we don't know the future, but uh, we hope uh, this uh, continue this, this program and this seminar. Okay, you can see, the conference by YouTube directly, but it's possible also uh, see the conference after because he, by YouTube, we will record uh, the conference, okay? Uh, uh, first, this seminar has, has, been, has been possible. Thank you, the collaboration. I think my friends, uh, Harry Robson and Miriam Cubas, and um, only save around the Juan Juibanez, he is a scientific research at, at the National Spanish Research Council. Uh, he has a permanent position at the Mila Fontana Institutions in Barcelona. He is a specialist in the study of the Neolithic in the Near East. And he, he was and he has direct, directed the excavation in different Natufians and pre ceramic sites in Syria uh, before the war, of course. Uh, Lebanon and Jordan. Finally, he, uh, all people he know, he is a specialist in use one analysis in prehistoric tools. Hello, Juanjo. Thank you for accepting this invitation. Yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I, uh, I would like to start uh, acknowledging um, Antonio Pizzo, Miriam Cubas, uh, Juan Jibaja, uh, Harry Robson for inviting me to speak this afternoon. And I, I would like to, to speak about the origins of the Neolithic in the Near East. Uh, I hope we manage to, to share. Uh, Sorry. Lo consigue, sí. Ah, este mismo. Ahí, no sé. Ajá. A ver. Abajo tienes una pestaña verde que pone compartir pantalla. Sí, ajá, eso es. Pero no veo. Aquí está. Ok. Ok. ¿Está bien? Bien. So, um, as you know, uh, the, the, the transition from uh, hunter-gatherer to uh, farming societies um, first took place in uh, the Near East. There, were, there are several focus, several places where this transition took place uh, along the, the, the globe, in, in, along, uh, in the world. And it was uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Babilov, who at the beginning of the last century, uh, hypothesized uh, and uh, detected places where this transition could have been placed, could have been uh, located. And one of these focus was uh, the Near East. And this was uh, confirmed uh, by archeological research, uh, first carried out by Dorothy Garrett, uh, uh, discovering a new culture that uh, she uh, uh, coined as Natufian because she excavated in Wadi al Natuf. And she thought that this uh, culture uh, uh, was uh, uh, the first manifestation of uh, farming and sedentary societies. But in fact, now we know that uh, they, they, they were. They were the Natufian people were the last hunter gatherers in, in the Levant. <clears throat> After that, another uh, main lady of archaeology, Kathleen Kenyon, uh, excavating in Jericho, 
uh, she uh, could document this transition uh, in this site in uh, current Palestine, uh, located in Palestine. Uh, and there she uh, discovered uh, what she called prepotry Neolithic A and prepotry Neolithic B. That is the earliest Neolithic communities uh, that uh, carries out this transition and in which pottery was not already known. Uh, so after this uh, research, uh, it seemed clear that uh, the transition in the, in the Southwest Asia took mainly place in uh, Southern Levant around the Jordan Valley. That was what it was that was thought at that moment. Uh, so there we had Natufian communities, the last hunter gatherers, uh, and uh, early Neolithic communities, uh, local early Neolithic communities. So the transition uh, was clearly documented in this area. And it was hypothesized that uh, uh, even uh, Natufian communities expanded during the um, Jungle Dryas to other places. Uh, but uh, new research during the 70s of the last century uh, showed that the scenario was more complex because research carried out by Jacques Covan and Mauritius Van Loon in uh, Ten Murebe and Andrew Moore and Gordon Hillman in Abu Ureida in the Euphrates region, in this place, in this area, showed that there in the middle Euphrates, the, the transition also take play, took place. So, for example, in Murebet, uh, uh, there are uh, stratigraphy showing uh, Natufian and early, early uh, Neolithic communities. So uh, at that moment, it was clear that the transition had been taking place both in Southern Levant, around the Jordan Valley, and also in the Middle Euphrates region. Uh, and the, during the, the last decade, or two decades, uh, more research carried out by several um, international teams around Southwest Asia is showing that the, this picture about the transition is much more complex and other regions were engaged in this communal effort uh, that was the origins of farming societies. Uh, one, one interesting case is, is uh, Cyprus, where some uh, British and French teams had been working, showing that there, uh, that Cyprus was incorporated to the community of uh, population that uh, were in transition to farming with PPNA, Pripoti Neolithic A, and Pripoti Neolithic B communities. So the most interesting thing here is that the, 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 the work shows that uh, mainland that communities from, from the continent uh, were traveling by, by boat to the island and they were carrying with them animals, uh, crops, people, tools, and the new way of living. So uh, there was uh, uh, a movement of population from the continent to the island, and uh, this, this island Cyprus was uh, also integrated in the community of uh, Southwest Asia as a place of uh, dynamic cultural transition. Another uh, Impressive uh, research carried out by German teams in Gobekli Tepe and in the Urfa region in South Turkey is showing the monumentality and complexity of these first uh, Neolithic communities. With, uh, uh, Gobekli is now understood as a site uh, where people were settled down. It's not only a cultural 
place, a cultural uh, site. But what is clear is that there are several monumental constructions, uh, building that were used uh, for commun communal uh, meetings, probably, and for uh, ritual activities. So these are some of the pictures uh, of the uh, monolith monolithic uh, constructions that you probably know. Uh, another area where a lot of work has been carried out is uh, the upper uh, Tigris region around Korti Tepe, Gushur Huyuk, Demirkoi, several sites where we are also, uh, this research is uh, showing that this transition was also taking place in the upper Tigris. So now we have three regions at least where this place, this transition was, was taking place in, in similar chronologies. Uh, and my point, my main point in this uh, talk will be how it's possible that uh, this uh, way towards farming was taking place in so distant regions in a similar chronology with uh, regional um, characteristics, with particularities, with regional particularities but all these regions were uh, walking in the same cultural direction. How was this possible? Uh, and as, we, you, as you will see, I suggest that the success of this transition was probably possible because the different regions were working as a network of sharing uh, of uh, experiences, and uh, objects and people, and that was made the transition to the Neolithic a resilient and successful uh, movement towards uh, a new way of living. And I'm going to speak about uh, our contribution to this effort. We have been working in the Near East for the last uh, 15 years. In, in Jordan, in Syria, and in Lebanon. And we started working uh, in collaboration with the San Jose University and the Direction of Antiquities in the, in the Natufian site of Jeftelik, that is uh, in the Homs region in Syria. And the importance of this site is that it's dated in the early Natufian and is outside what is considered what was previously considered to be the homeland of the Natufian culture. So with this site, we showed that the, uh, the, the region where the, where the Natufian culture that precede the transition to farming appeared was more wide than uh, considered before. Another important site we excavated in two, 2009 and 2010 in, in Karasa, it's uh, in the southern Syria, a Natufian site and an early PPMB site, an early Neolithic site, in collaboration with the French team directed by Frank Bremer. And uh, the site of Karasa 3 is placed on the basalt flow. Uh, it consists of 12 dwellings that are uh, associated one to another, here near one to, other, to the other. Yeah. Uh, so we can find here the basement of these uh, dwellings. Um, the importance of this site is that it shows us how a hamlet of the last, corresponding to the last hundred gatherers could look like uh, with 12 dwellings uh, placed uh, in an arc in a, on the, on the basaltic, basaltic flow uh, at the shore of an ancient lake that is now uh, dried. And you have here some of the, of the structures 
Some of them are, are very simple, just a round uh, structure of stones were probably dwellings that were constructed with perishable materials existed, but uh, two other uh, dwellings are more complex with some internal divisions for the first time. This is a very important uh, step towards the origins of the house. We will speak about that because the Neolithic is implies domestication and domestication implies domus, what means house in Latin. And uh, it is the moment where houses and villages were invented. And here we can see uh, another um, complex, another hut, another dwelling with a central fireplace, a, a, a pit that we think was a fireplace and, uh, and a stone alignment that is uh, the first, one of the first manifestations of the existence of walls. And interestingly, around these uh, 12 dwellings that we can see here, we documented more than 80 um, pit, pits that were uh, used, these this pits excavated in the, in the rock, in the basaltic rock. Uh, they, they are mortars. And we made uh, the analysis of use wear and residues uh, showing that these mortars were used for uh, 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 processing cereals. So at that moment, um, hunter-gatherers uh, were exploiting uh, wild cereals and they were processing them in these mortars. This is the, the analysis, the results of the analysis of the fauna remains showing that uh, these people hunted a big uh, array of diversity of animals, <clears throat> but uh, gases were very important in this hunting. And uh, from Teresa III, we go to the nearby ne early Neolithic uh, site. And here we, we can see important transition. This uh, site is dated in the mid ninth millennium calibrated BC. And here we, we find the first manifestation of the square uh, houses with walls. This is the house, this is the patio of this house. And, uh, so uh, uh, um, Neolithic houses during the PPNA were rounded and they uh, changed to squared houses during the PPNB. And here we, we at the starting of the PPNB, we documented uh, this transition in this area from rounded to, to a squared. And, uh, this site also showed us a funerary area that was displayed on the abandoned house, on the house that we saw previously. Uh, when the house was abandoned, they displayed this funerary area with a very complex uh, ritual and funerary customs. Uh, so if you're interested, we can discuss about them later. Uh, in, other, uh, in another place of this site, we've also found um, the remains of, uh, the, of a room uh, that was sealed, the house, the, the door of the room was sealed, and inside this uh, room we found two caches, caches two uh, hordes of uh, skulls, one with five, another with six, and other human remains. And interestingly, these, these skulls showed the uh, frontal part of the, of the, of the bones, the, the, skeleton, the skeleton corresponding to the face that was intentionally, intentionally destroyed. And we, we, we made some symbolic interpretation uh, about these uh, characteristics. Uh, most of the individuals were male and young. 
uh, it was uh, Carassa also the um, archaeobotanical analysis showed that the the cereals at that point around 8500 8, calibrated BP were being domesticated so there are some morphological characteristics in the chart uh, remains in the chart seeds and chaff showing that uh, these people were domesticating cereals, barley and wheat. And these correspond to the older um, uh, domestic indication, the older indication of, 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 char, of uh, cereal domestication in the Near East. Uh, another uh, interesting aspect of this site was uh, that uh, the uh, botanical and the uh, environmental analysis carried out on charcoal, pollen, phytoliths, and isotopic analysis showed that during the 300 years uh, that the site was occupied, uh, the environment started to be affected around the site, around the village. So indicating that probably these Neolithic people affected the environment around the site more than we thought before. And here uh, I show you the site of Haraisin that we are excavating in collaboration with Juan Muñiz uh, from 2014. It's in Jordan, in Northern Jordan near the uh, Sarka River, and there we are excavating in four areas. Here is the plan of the excavation. This is area A, where we can see several uh, structures. Here you can see um, two dwellings corresponding to the older period. This is the, the late reported in Neolithic A. And here you have the uh, pre-potting Neolithic B houses. So the older houses in this side were just uh, very simple oval uh, dwellings excavated on the ground. The, the walls of the pit, the limits of the pit were reinforced with uh, alignment of stones. And they were, uh, and the floors were made with uh, uh, with earth, with uh, with clay. Uh, these these dwellings uh, are dated at the beginning of the ninth millennium, calibrated BC. But the nearby dwelling that is a bit uh, younger, uh, around eight eight. Uh, 1,800 B, uh, calibrated BC showed the first um, lime plaster mortar floor. So for that, for, for covering the floor in this dwelling, they made lime plaster, they made, they made lime burning, burning uh, a stone, limestone, so arriving to um, 800 degrees. And after that, they, they mixed the, the, the lime with uh, other products to make a mortar for covering the floor. And the floor is uh, still uh, keeps some remains of uh, red colorant. So it was covered by, 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 by red colorant. So this, this first, this first uh, dwelling in transition to houses uh, showed uh, uh, some aesthetic uh, elements. And uh, to the north and to the south, we can see uh, houses, square houses, remains of square houses corresponding to the, um, to the uh, PPMB period. They are uh, arranged in parallel in two lines distant 10 meters one to the other. Uh, so uh, we think that uh, the, 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 the settlement could look something like this. This was made by Spanish television and we acknowledge them for this reconstruction, the program Archeomania. Uh, 
And uh, another interesting thing is that, as we show, showed in uh, Caracha, in Harisin, the abandoned houses were also used as a funerary area. And there we have uh, some burials, also some hordes of tools. Here you can see some of the, the burials. Uh, individuals were uh, buried uh, in a flexed position, but interestingly, uh, after a, a, a while, after a period of time, the, the uh, tomb was open and some parts of the body were extracted, mainly the, the skull, but not only, also some long bones, and some rituals were carried out with these, with these bones. And uh, in many cases, these bones were re reburied in the funerary area as secondary deposits, as we can see here. We can see uh, one skull. These are human bones. And interestingly, this is a goat bone. In some cases, animals were, uh, animal remains were uh, integrated in the burials. So that means a kind of familiarity with, with animals that probably were being uh, domesticated at that period. And here we can like, uh, show you two uh, human figurines made on uh, clay at the right. But uh, what we think are uh, schematic representations of human uh, silhouettes uh, than in flint. Flint is normally used for making tools, but these are no tools. We made the user analysis and we made uh, statistic uh, analysis of their shape, uh, comparing them with the sculptures found at and Gazal, and we think they, that they are human schematic representations. Uh, so uh, in the funerary area, we can find primary burials, secondary burials, human figurines, and other hordes. So we think that this is not only uh, a funerary place, but it's a ritual place where some rituals probably of memory of ancestors and of uh, memory of uh, deceased people uh, took place. And this is another uh, area, these houses that uh, are dated in the second half of the ninth millennium. This is correspond to zone B of the site. And in this case, houses are agglomerated when uh, attached to the other. They are squared or roughly squared uh, houses. They have a fireplace in the middle. One of them is especially big, this one. And we are going to see uh, this house uh, a bit more uh, thoroughly. And here uh, we have the fireplace, rounded fireplace to uh, pits for the for supporting the roof for for the for the for, for the wood uh, that was supporting the roof and uh, uh, inside the wall we found three skulls so uh, these people were uh, using the the bones of their deceits uh, to use them in the houses probably indicating that they were houses where the family was settled, but that also um, considered their ancestors as part of the living community. And in the corner of one uh, of the house, we found the remains of uh, a, a burnt wood, and under this wood, uh, these wood planks, we found a lot of human remains, skulls and other human remains. So this was like a pit where uh, human remains were uh, placed. And this is something that is waiting for us. We, will, we hope that we will excavate uh, them uh, next autumn. If uh, COVID 
allows us to go. And uh, I show you another uh, area, zone C of the site with the square, uh, square houses and uh, also a line, line plaster um, floor in one of the rooms. Uh, and in, in, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, plaster floor, we found uh, some motifs, uh, abstract motifs painted with red colorant. Uh, they were uh, restored, the floor was extracted, restored, and is now part of the collection of the uh, Archaeological Museum in Amman. And what is interesting is that here in Harisin, we have um, floor, painted floors with abstract motives, like we found, like, like was were found in Ein Gazal uh, by Gary Rolfson. So he found abstract motives that we can see here. In other sites of the New East in the Neolithic, there are geometric motives or even human or animal representations. But here we find a kind of abstract motives. So maybe indicating that there were some styles, regional styles, uh, and, and also in the showing that uh, many of the movement, artistic movement that we think are very modern, in fact, they have more than 8,000 years. Uh, uh, I will tell you something about uh, domestication of animals. Uh, we know now that uh, animal domestication took place around 8,500 8, uh, calibrated before Christ. And uh, animal domestication of goats, sheep, uh, cows, and pigs took place uh, in extended area uh, spreading from the uh, Middle Euphrates and the upper Tigris. Uh, goats are also present in the Damascus area in these early dates, and they were very early transported to Cyprus. Uh, so uh, animals were domesticated in parallel to plants. So the, this was a move, movement. It was a technical uh, challenge and also probably was something related to uh, a psychological and mental transition of this population that started to dominate nature in an unprecedented uh, degree. Here we can see uh, the, 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 the analysis of founder remains of uh, Haraisin carried by Lionel Gourichon. And uh, goat is, is, is the most exploited animal and it was pro most probably in process of domestication. Uh, because uh, we, 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 we have uh, um, spoken about the transition to agriculture and most probably this is in debate, but most probably uh, plant domestication was preceded by a period of a cultivation of wild uh, plants. And this map shows you what was happening around 8,700, uh, uh, so in the ninth millennium calibrated BC. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, cultivated cereals were in process of domestication in different regions uh, of the Southwest Asia, Asia in uh, the upper uh, Euphrates, but also in Southern Levant. So again, things are happening uh, at similar chronologies in different places. Here, we have an image of what, uh, what was happening with respect to uh, cereal cultivation in the uh, in the in, in the in the eighth millennium calibrated, and we can see two things. First, that uh, domestic uh, cereals were present in, in uh, different areas of the Near East, and second, that was an uh, the transition towards domestication 
was an uneven process that was not taking place in the same rhythm, in the same place. So for example, in Saint Saint Levant, we, some, we have some sites where domestic cereals are dominant, another that are, were in process, and other sites where, where the cereals were uh, still dominant. So interestingly, what was happening is that sometimes the advances are taking place in very different and very distant regions at the same time, while in very in nearby sites, in nearby villages, uh, they were uh, still uh, not incorporated. So this is a, a process of uh, innovation that is not spread like uh, stain, uh, that is going uh, progressively from one place to the other places but it's something that is happening in a network um, system. Uh, we will speak about that because this is uh, uh, something that can uh, show us something about how people innovate. Uh, well, just going uh, ahead, uh, we can see that we have made some analysis of confocal microscopy or sickle blades. And what we can see is that, uh, as we saw with uh, archaeobotanical remains, uh, the transition towards agriculture was taking place in different places at different rhythms. And that probably uh, um, domestication was preceded by a period in which uh, people were cultivating cereals that were still uh, morphologically uh, wild. So that's the image we have now in the Near East. Uh, 40 years ago, we thought that everything happened or started in Southern Levant. Uh, and from there, it was spread to other regions. But now we know that other regions were contributing to this uh, transition. Uh, not only South Levan, but also Cyprus, uh, the Middle Euphrates and Upper Euphrates, and the uh, Upper Tigris region. And nearby uh, regions like uh, Konya Plain in, in Turkey, or uh, the Southern Sagros region in, in Iraq, were being uh, accepted or, or experimented this transition towards the Neolithic very early at the mid uh, ninth millennium calibrated. So there are, we don't know, we not only have a focus, we, say we have several focus and some uh, regions that are uh, where the, 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 this new way of living spread very quick. But as you know, uh, for this way, new way of living to spread out of Southwest Asia, it should, have, it should take more than 1,500 years. So the Neolithic started here with the contribution of several regions, but it was still confined to this region to the, to the Near East, I mean, before the uh, diaspora, before the spread to Europe could start around 7,000 years before Christ. So how this could happen? Why uh, these regions were moving in the same direction, even if, we, if they were very distant. And my point, and the point of other specialists, of course, is that uh, they were working in a network system, collaborating in a certain sense, and exchanging uh, experiences, objects, and sometimes people also. Uh, but this uh, communication as deep networks was, was a kind of complex network in which not all the nodes, not all the villages were uh, associated or were connected uh, in the same way, but they were like hubs 
like places, like villages that were more dynamic than others. And there was like, uh, some, these hubs, these progressive villages were interconnected, making like the core uh, that was not, was not regionally uh, confined, but was spread all along uh, the Near East. And we can see that in one element that is obsidian. Obsidian uh, during the origins of the Neolithic, uh, the origin of obsidian is uh, South Turkey in Cappadocia and Eastern uh, Anatolia. And it was spread uh, uh, along the whole Near East during the Neolithic. How this uh, um, rock move? How was this? How was this rock transport? How was transported? Uh, at the beginning, or according to Renfrew's analysis, he thought that this uh, rock could have been transported from side to side. Uh, so the rock arrived from one side to, to the next one in a very simple network. But we have carried out some uh, um, mathematic modeling of this model. And we have shown that in fact, the quantity of subsidian that is present in the Neolithic villages uh, in the Near East uh, cannot be explained by a simple network in which all the nodes had the same role, but it should be explained by a complex network system. This is uh, some uh, graphics showing the results of uh, our modeling. But what is, is interesting that you can see here the quantity of obsidian that is present in the in the near eastern sites. These are the, the origins of the obsidian is here and here, and you can see that progressively the obsidian reached more uh, in in, in uh, higher quantities. Uh, several sites of the near east, and uh, what is this showing? Uh, obsidian is showing, uh, in fact, it's like a testimony of interaction. So people was exchanging obsidian because they were in contact, because they needed uh, to give presents, because uh, in fact, obsidian is showing that people for the first time needed to establish networks of communication this was the period when sedentary living started. So uh, the, the, the communities uh, had the risk to be isolated because they were mostly sedentary. So for avoiding that, uh, they established a kind of network of interaction between villages, allowing a distant connection and allowing uh, also that the new, the new, the innovations uh, could spread from one place to the other. And also they made the system very resilient because everybody was working uh, in the same direction and they could be stuck uh, they, they could store some uh, advances. For example, uh, agriculture is a very delicate and very uh, fragile system. So when some years of uh, crop failure are uh, changed, the, 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 the whole process of uh, towards agriculture is in risk. But if other communities uh, also possess this kind of crops, they could be uh, shared after uh, these problems of failure. So uh, this network also allowed the Neolithic to be a successful 
and dynamic process. They were working in network, they were collaborating in a certain way. Um, so uh, that was, uh, I wanted to show you uh, there are new advances uh, in our knowledge of the Neolithic in the Near East. Uh, the CSIC, the Spanish National Research Country uh, Council, has contributed uh, to this uh, development of these advances in our knowledge of the Neolithic with several excavations. And we are now uh, starting to understand how this transition um, uh, was, was carried out, how it, 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 it is. Uh, uh, showing that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the model of uh, core area, the model of uh, focus and spread that we had before for explaining this uh, transition does not work. Uh, it's not. It's not uh, something related to the innovation taking innovation taking place in one place, and. Uh, spread uh, outside. It's something that is more complex and that is uh, affecting different regions that are working at the same time uh, with uh, particularities, of course, but that uh, made an enormous step ahead uh, in the transition of humanity towards what we call civilization. Because we cannot forget that these people were inventing agriculture, sedentary living, houses, villages, uh, livestock. So main uh, elements that could make possible the, uh, our, our current way of life. So thank you very much for your attention. If there, if there are any questions, uh, please tell me. Okay, thank you, Juanjo. Uh, if you have a question by the chat of uh, YouTube, but I don't know because I, I think there is a, the time of YouTube is different time directly here, the Juanjo. This is uh, no, it's parallel, it's in, it's in the same time. Es que so you have... Es que a la, eh, yo estoy mirando YouTube y todavía no ha acabado la conferencia en YouTube, por eso... Eh, bueno. Bueno, si tenéis alguna... Do you have any comments or questions? Or... Yeah, there is a question in the, in the chat. Eva Fernández. Oh. Eh, Eva. Hi, hi Eva. How are you? Thank you for such an interesting talk. And the question is, do you think these networks or part of them were already present among in Paleolithic hunter-gatherers groups? Yeah. Mm. We detect these uh, networks because of the presence of some materials, for example, shells, coming from the Mediterranean or the Red Sea or obsidian, as we said, or other uh, lithics that are uh, exotic. Uh, what we see uh, during the Paleolithic, during the Natufian period, is that obsidian is, uh, is present in very scarce quantities in southern Levant. So the big connex connection between northern and southern Levant uh, was not uh, established yet. But at the same time, some analysis carried out in Natufian sites indicate that they were, there were some networks of exchange that, um, that could uh, uh, make some material come from, for example, 200 or 300 kilometers. So, so these people were changing they were sharing and they were uh, uh, moving uh, materials, not in the, at the scale uh, of the Neolithic, uh, because 
uh, at the New York City, yeah, the, 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 the network of exchange were more and more and more developed, especially during the PPMV. But, but in fact, yeah, the, during the, the Natufian period, the, these hunter gatherers, they, 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 they had, they had their network, networks and they exchange. Uh, yeah. uh, interestingly, um, we have uh, Jonathan Santana working with us in, 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 in Harisin. Uh, he had carried out um, isotopic analysis of some sites in Southern Levant, showing that uh, for, for Ain Malaha, for example, um, people in, in the site seem to come from different places. During the Neolithic, uh, most of the people is local. So it seems that the Neolithic uh, sites did not uh, change a lot of people. Some some of the people are are foreigners, but most of them are local. But uh, during the Natufian period uh, at Ain Malaha, uh, an, an important proportion of people come from different places. So maybe they were moving also. Uh, they were exchanging and they were moving and they were maybe uh, joining uh, people from different places in the, this first sedentary or semi-sedentary villages as, as, as uh, in Malaha. So this is something that we can say. I mean, these networks are probably present also in the, uh, at least in a preliminary way in the, in, 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 in the Natufian during the Epipaleolithic. Brilliant. I'll jump in then, Juan. Uh, firstly, many thanks for giving the talk. And uh, secondly, thanks very much for a very interesting talk. I, I must admit, I'm, I'm not, not an expert on this, this area of, uh, of the world or, or time period whatsoever, but I have a, I have a few questions anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. These flint, these flint figurines. I remember seeing the article last year. Are they specifically to Jordan, or are they elsewhere throughout the region as well? Uh, for the moment, they have been also identified at Harisin. This is uh, the only place, but um, maybe they existed in other places because uh, our chance was that. Uh, they appeared in a, in a in specific area and they appeared in quantities in the sense, uh, like uh, we have uh, like uh, 100 uh, and they are still appearing. So that's why we, we could identify them. If you, if you see them one by one, sometimes you can say, okay, this could be a tool or maybe it's something I don't understand. But when, when you, you can see, when you see the, the, the group and group, together, you, you notice and, uh, that they are something specific, that they are no tools. Someone who knows the, the, the tools corresponding to the, to the PPMB knows that this is a very standardized technology, uh, bipolar napping and um, very beautiful harrow heads and so on. And this, this, these are not uh, tools. But I suppose, I, I suspect that this could appear in other places. And I, I hope that now people will be attentive to this kind of uh, uh, elements and, and maybe they, will, they could appear in other places. But what is more usual is to find these figurines in clay or in, in, in sometimes in stone or in, 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 in uh, both. Mm. Mm. Great. And uh, Juanjo, find you these, these figurines, find you in a special area of the, of yeah. the Caraisin, in a special room with uh, association with the schools, or is for everywhere? Yeah, the distribution, uh, distribution of the objects shows that they come from zone A, and especially they come from the, the area around the, the, the Boreans. Ah, okay. Yeah, they are associated to the to the primary and secondary burials. burials. So, so we think that uh, they are very, uh, they can be made very easily, um, and we think that they they were part of the uh, of rituals of remembering something like this related to the burials. In in uh, Tel Karasa, in Tel Kar in Karasa, in Tel Karasa, uh, we found uh, also. 
some uh, human figurines and a, a, a bone a fragment with two uh, human faces associated to the to the burials to the to the funerary area. Uh, so so we think that some at least some of these figurines or these human representations that are really typical of the Neolithic, because the Neolithic is also a transition from animal to human uh, figurative art. Also, that's an interesting element. But uh, they, some of them are at least associated with, with uh, thinking and, and, and uh, rituals uh, uh, related with disease, with, with uh, funerary areas, and so on. I also have another question as well. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so, is there any evidence for the uh, for a continuation in, say, Mesolithic or hunter gatherer uh, lifestyles, subsistence practices, uh, burial traditions, customs, or the use of uh, stone tools, for instance? You mean uh, there are what we call cultures? I mean, uh, patterns? Yeah. Um, there are, yeah. And uh, uh, even uh, during the during the Mesolithic in the uh, in the south of Levant, we have uh, around the, what we call the core area, what was called the homeland of Natufian. There are uh, some uh, uh, characteristic uh, related to lithic tools, for example, to um, uh, symbolic paraphernalia that uh, they show very consistent uh, elements. But there are uh, other regional um, characteristics. For example, we find similar industries in, uh, in, the, in, in the Middle Euphrates or in, um, in Syria, in Northern Syria, uh, uh, related to Southern Levant, but they, uh, they, they have some regional particularities, but, but the, the background, the cultural background is, is very similar. The industry is based on unipolar napping and um, uh, uh, lunates and uh, uh, also uh, artist, uh, artistic elements or, or symbolic elements so um, similar characteristics with the andas and, and the style is, is, is uh, quite consistent so this uh, making uh, joining this or linking this question to the one that Eva made uh, we can say that the, this um, cultural um, similarities uh, that uh, we we spoke about during the, the Neolithic also were present in the in the Mesolithic also, uh, and it's more and more clear that the roots of the many things that are happening that happened during the early Neolithic are present in the in the Mesolithic there. So, uh, yeah, thanks. We still, we still uh, speak about the Neolithic revolution, but in fact, it's a very smooth revolution. It's something mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, it's happening uh, during several millennia, and it's a process that is taking place um, very slowly. And, and as an add on to that, thanks very much. Uh, one final point, has any isotopic analysis been undertaken on the uh, human remains? Yeah, there are uh, some uh, analysis. Uh, the problem, uh, at least in Southern Levant, is that uh, uh, the preservation of uh, organic remains is not very good. This is very bad for the DNA and also for some of the isotopic analysis. Mm -hmm. But we obtain good results with uh, strontium isotope, isotopes. Uh, the, the isotopic signal for strontium is uh, there are uh, some regions that show the same or similar 
signal. For example, the, uh, the Jordan Highlands is extended regions with very similar isotopic signal. But uh, on the contrary, for example, the Jordan Valley, the, uh, the, the um, Jordan Highlands, or the uh, basaltic region of uh, the Leia. So there are some regions that can be detected by isotopic analysis. And the, the analysis that is uh, being carried out by, by similar researchers, uh, Jonathan Santana among them, is indicating that uh, for the Neolithic, people were more, more were local. That uh, if, if, for example, around 10%, only 10% of the of the people are, are foreigners uh, or were uh, stayed uh, uh, in in other places during the, their childhood, but most of the people is local. But uh, for the for the Mesolithic, this is not the case. It seems that the higher proportion of of people comes from from several places during the Natufian, so maybe they they were moving more. Uh, but it's a delicate question because uh, we cannot say that the, if they show a similar uh, isotopic signal, they are local because there are some areas that are relatively extended that show similar uh, signals. But uh, yeah, some studies start to be done in, in this direction. I think it's very interesting. And this analysis was carried out uh, by uh, Jonathan Santana in, in Durham University. Uh, Great, you thanks. Yeah, welcome. And we've also got a, uh, another question in the chat uh, and it says, it's by, uh, I assume, Mart Mart Sancho. Uh, Have you carried out demographic modeling or the estimation in the region. For example, population density between Natufian and uh, pre-pottery Neolithic A and B per region throughout say the, uh, the central and upper Euphrates. Yeah, this has been, something has been done, for example, by, by Nigel Gordon Morris and also by Ian Kate. Uh, showing the, 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 the growing population, the more sites and more extended sites. Uh, the problem sometimes is that, uh, for example, uh, we start having in the Mesolithic uh, places that are around uh, half an hectare in extension or even, or even less. And at the end of the PPMB, we can have some places, for example, Gerisan, uh, has 25 hectares. So this indicates a, 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 an, an important, very important increase in population. We are not sure if all the extension of the sites were uh, populated or were uh, being uh, occupied at the same time. But, but uh, what we see uh, is that uh, this process of uh, increase in the size and in the quantity of sites changes around 7,600, 8, 8, 6, uh, around this period at the end of the PPMB, uh, before the, the starting of pottery Neolithic, there, are, there seems to be a collapse of this model in which uh, sites were more and more extended and populated. At that moment, it seems that the, the model of uh, uh, occupation changed and sites are uh, um, smaller. Maybe there are more sites, but smaller. So maybe it seems that the model uh, of the Neolithic was not sustainable. Uh, and there is a debate uh, about what this unsustainability consists of, if it was because of uh, environmental um, crisis or social or economic. But what it is interesting, and it may be something to think about that, is that when the Neolithic goes out of the nearest of the Southwest Asia, is when, when this model is changing. 
So there is a model of concentration of people in big sites. Maybe there is a collapse and a new model of a different, um, of more and numerous and smaller sites. And maybe people were more than dynamic for, for traveling. This is just a hypothesis, but that's the moment of um, when, when the Neolithic uh, starts to move out of the, of the place. But answering to the question, uh, I think that uh, the modeling of population uh, increase and, and evolution is, is, is already to be done, something that has to be done. And uh, also there are also very interesting hypotheses about the demographic transition in the Neolithic by Professor Bouquet-Appel, that is, I advise you to, to consult uh, how probably uh, changes in uh, fertility uh, uh, were crucial for this uh, increase in population. And this fertility was uh, promoted by the sedentarism. But there are many, many factors that could uh, feed this uh, modeling uh, about population. But uh, to my knowledge, it's something that has to be done. So, so, so there is field to, to research in this direction. OK, thanks very much. Uh, we shall see if uh, you've answered the question, which <laughs> I personally think you have. But uh, yeah, we'll see if there, there is any more. Uh, response on the chat because there is a slight delay. Uh, mm. yeah. Oh, they've responded. They've said thank you. So I think that that you have. Uh, Miriam, Juan, do you have uh, any other questions? Uh, no, if you want, we can uh, finish. If you want. Um, yeah, Miriam? Yeah, I don't have any question thank you and i think in the chat we don't have more questions okay only for remember the next uh, conference is 12th uh, april uh, same time uh, is uh, federica fontana will speak will speak around the alps uh, mesolithic in alps and sure she she uh, will speak around the mont de Val side because it's very 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 important site um, yes, uh, also thank you, Antonio and Pizzo, for the introduction and the school. And also, Matteo is uh, the technical uh, for your technical work. <laughs> and um, uh, some days before the next uh, conference, we, we will send uh, the new poster with the information about the conference and uh, by the web. Uh, website of the school and the website and the Facebook from the Mesolithic Miscellanea and Neolithic Miscellanea. Okay. Uh, thank you for all, for all people. Thank you, Juanjo. You're welcome. <laughs> and, okay. We hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. <laughs>